Well, another uh, history-making day here in Tokyo because we are going to see New Zealand weightlifter Laurel Hubbard becoming the first openly transgender athlete to compete in a different gender category to which she was born. Now, Laurel's entry into the Olympics is being seen by many as a landmark moment for inclusion and diversity. There are others, though, that argue that she has an unfair physiological advantage and that her presence undermines the struggle for women to be treated equally in sport. Fallon Fox is a former mixed martial arts and transgender athlete. She's an advocate for transgender sports men and women. She welcomed the news about Laurel Hubbard. Transgender people, when we go through transition, there's a lot of differences, or a lot of, excuse me, reduction in muscle strength and endurance and a lot of other things in sports. So there's no unfair advantages in sports um, as far as um, science is concerned. Now, as we've been hearing, the New Zealand weightlifter Laurel Hubbard will make history later by becoming the first openly transgender athlete to compete in an Olympics. Her participation in the event has provoked debate, but Laurel Hubbard says she's not here to change the world. She went on, it's not really my job to change what they think, what they feel and what they believe. I just hope they look at the bigger picture rather than just trusting whatever their gut may have told them. Well, let's talk now to Nicola Williams from Fair Play for Women. Thank you very much for joining me. Um, in your view, is Laurel Hubbard cheating? Laurel Hubbard is um, complying with the rules, but it's the rules that are wrong um, because the IOC has basically opened up the female category to include now people who are born male. Um, and, you know, we have to think, why do we have male and female categories in the first place in sport? And it's because male and female bodies are different and male bodies go through a male driven puberty with testosterone and women don't. Um, and that's why someone like Laurel Hubbard will have a male advantage because we say, you know, did Laurel Hubbard go through a, a male puberty and did, did Laurel benefit from a lifetime on testosterone? Well, the answer is yes. So um, Laurel belongs in the category for people who have benefited from testosterone and that's the male category. So it's wrong that the IOC have allowed Laurel into the female category. It's unfair on the other competitors. Uh, but Ms. Williams, you might say she might have gone through a, a lifetime of testosterone. She's had her testosterone. Laurel has had uh, the testosterone levels within her body reduced for the last 12 months. Yeah, and we know that that doesn't really reverse the, um, the all of the different effects of male puberty. I mean, and we know that um, and many studies have started to show um, that reducing testosterone later in life is not enough to reduce um, uh, muscle strength, for example. But, you know, we don't even need scientific research to tell us this. You know, it's it's not rocket science. Um, we can see today that we'll have Laurel Hubbard joining um, some of the best female lifters in the world. They're at their peak performance. They're average age 24. But Laurel Hubbard is a veteran male lifter. The only reason that Laurel Hubbard has been able to qualify for the Olympics is because Laurel has that male advantage. You know, it would be unheard of for a female lifter who hadn't had all of the advantages of male puberty to still be lifting at international level at the age of 43. None of the other lifters will still be lifting um, at the Olympics in 20 years time. So that's the proof, you know, that's what all we need. Um, you can see that Laurel Hubbard has the advantage because Laurel Hubbard has competed. So an ordinary male has taken the place of an extraordinary female and that's why that's wrong. But surely if this was a really existential threat to women's sport, this would have happened before now. I mean, this is the fact that this is happening now in 2021 with one athlete in weightlifting, does that not say to you that actually the threat here to sport and to the fairness of sport, you know, and everything that that entails has been completely overblown? This is the first Olympic cycle where the rules have applied. So this is the first time that the Olympics um, have allowed um, people who are born male to reduce their testosterone to get into female sports. So this is the first time and already in the first Olympic cycle, we've got a work, we've got a, um, a heavyweight um, male lifter um, on the female stage. So um, in future, um, how many more? Um, Male, male people will be in the female categories. So, 
you know, we have to remember there's nothing wrong here with trans people being in the Olympics. I think it's great. In fact, there are lots of trans people um, having their debut at the Olympics this year. But the key here is that those trans people need to be in the right category. And so we've got other trans people. Uh, there are non-binary people that are competing. Um, there were people who are born female, identify as non-binary, but are in the right category because they're competing in the female category. So Laurel Hubbard needs to compete in the category of her sex, which is male. So she can identify as female, but her sex is male. So that's the category that matters for sport uh, because sport is about bodies, not about feelings. So, well, listening to that is Natalie Washington uh, from Pride Sports, um, which uh, aims to improve access to sport for LGBT plus people. Thank you very much for joining me, Natalie. I mean, what do you Good make of that? You. It sounds pretty dehumanising. It's about sex. It's not about feelings. Yes, and I, I think this is the danger that we see when this topic is talked about a lot, is that we find trans people, trans bodies, trans uh, people of whatever gender they they are are yeah are being dehumanized and and the rhetoric around this it's it's dangerous sometimes it it means that we um are talking about body parts we're talking about people as scientific specimens we're talking about people as if they're uh, you know a few cells in a petri dish rather than a living breathing human being with with thoughts and fears and hopes and dreams and what we're talking about here you know for me Laurel Hubbard competing in the Olympics is immensely inspiring. And there are young trans people out there, older trans people out there seeing this and thinking, wow, somebody like me has got onto this global stage and has achieved their hopes and dreams. And may maybe I can as well. And when we talk about sport, um, you know, at the elite level, of course, it's about minute gains and it's about, you know, um, getting your body to that that peak level where you can compete at the highest level. And of course, everybody there is doing that. But what it's also about is showing our rich society for all it is. It's showing inspirational figures for children to look up to and think I can be like them. It's showing, um, it's giving people an opportunity to fully participate in the society that, they're, that they, they're part of. And I think that often gets missed when we talk about this. And, and, and whilst obviously there, there are huge strides being made and, and um, in terms of representation and in terms of what sport can mean to people and to make it more inclusive and accessible, ultimately sport, there are winners and there are losers. And for that, there have to be rules, there are rules, there are rules of engagement. And for that, that, that means that there has to be a sense of fairness. And th this is where I think people struggle, is where on the spectrum should sports sit between on one end fairness and, and, and the other inclusion? I mean, d do, you have, do you have any sympathy with that view? I mean, absolutely, you know, sport has to be fair, you know, the, 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 particularly, of course, at the elite level, we're talking about its people's livelihoods, you know, it's very, very important that we have, you know, that we do the utmost to make sure that everyone's competing on as much of a level playing field as possible. Um, now, of course, there's lots of ways that sport is is unfair, you know, some people are able to throw a lot more money at their training than other people can, some people have innate biological advantages because of the way their bodies have developed, irrespective of whether they're trans or not. So we we try to make sport at a level playing field as possible. And at the moment, we have a set of rules which have been based upon scientific evidence that has been, uh, you know, looked at by people far cleverer than I um, to, to understand that you know, this is this is a level that we've said is acceptable for now. And that will continue to be looked at. Right. We're talking about this now. You know, this is a this is a hot topic. There's no way that the people responsible for making these rules are not going to be held to account to make sure that those rules are right. Um, and it will be, continue to be looked at. But at the moment, the understanding we have is that um, people competing at an elite level, provided they follow the rules which are set in place, which, you know, are, are quite rigorous. And, you know, I, I have personal experience of following these rules, even to compete at a grassroots level in sport. Um, very rigorous, very difficult. Um, and we we have come to a conclusion that, that that's fair. Um, and I think what we need to be doing is accepting that the science we have at the moment is telling us that and, and uh, you know, celebrating the achievements of people that are achieving what, what, they're, what they're doing right now un, under the rule set that we have. The, the problem here does seem to be that uh, there's an idea that one 
ideology or one set of rules will, will fit all. And of course, all sports, for example, are different. And there is, for example, in team sports, in contact sports, there's an element of safety that needs to be considered here as well. It's not just fairness or inclusion or accessibility. It's also the safety of the competitors. Should the rules be different from sport to sport, or does that just confuse the whole thing even further? Yeah, I mean, so it's a fascinating question because obviously in an ideal world, you'd want absolute consistency across the board. You know, that, that would be simplest. But even now, sports have different rules from one from one sport to another. Even again, even aside from from you know around trans people. So at the moment, yeah, sports go go ahead and make their their own rules. Um, I think depending on the type of sport, it may well be that um, we make different rules depending on the types of bodies that may compete that. And of course. This is a problem that exists even outside of, of the realm of trans identity. You know, um, there's a lot of debate, for example, uh, in, in rugby uh, at youth levels about different sized bodies, people that have developed at different speeds. Is it is it safe for them to, to compete with each other? So we have to follow the science. We have to follow the experts. But when we when those those experts make a judgment, we have to we have to go with that. Mm, interesting. Um, I I yep. think we're going to have to leave it there for the moment, but okay. really interesting. Thank you very much for your insights. Natalie Washington from Pride Sports. Thank you. Thank you.